Jerusalem Ford Church and welcome to Church Online. My name is Alyssa and I'm one of the leaders here. And I'm so glad that you are here with us this morning. We are currently meeting in homes throughout the city. I know that I've really enjoyed being with people in community on Sunday mornings the last couple of weeks. Whether you are in your own home or in one of our house church locations, we trust that God is going to speak to you individually and personally this morning. We hope you had an awesome worship experience beforehand. And if you're still looking for a place to worship, you can visit our Sunday page to find more information about house churches we have located throughout the city. Before I pass it off to Stacy for our message today, I just have a couple quick announcements for you. Parents, head over to 614church.org forward slash Sunday to see a link to video lessons for your kids with activities you can print and follow along with. This week on 614 Kids, your kids will dive in to what hope means. If you call 614 Church home, one of the ways we continue to worship together is through giving. If you would like to give, go to 614church.org forward slash give. Ladies, follow the corner on Instagram and Facebook to find weekly videos of women from all over the world giving us a word of encouragement. Youth group is tonight at 7 p.m. at Becca Tozer's house. Send a direct message to the youth Instagram for the address. Save the date. We will be having our next prayer and worship night on July 8th in person, which is so exciting. I cannot wait at 7 p.m. at the Aspen Inn in Grandview. We cannot wait to worship together in the safest way possible. I know that I've definitely missed it and I am so excited. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Stacy for our message this morning. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven on earth as it is in heaven. I want to talk about why and how we should bring the kingdom of God here on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to look quickly, um, this isn't the text for today, but I want to look quickly at Revelation 7 verse 9. John is having a vision and he, he sees this and, and writes, After this I saw a vast crowd too great to count from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. This morning, ultimately, I want to show that uh, a person's ethnicity doesn't uh, hurt them, or doesn't inhibit them in the kingdom of God. And because of that, we should work here today so that it doesn't hurt anyone in our current context. Racism, equality, and equity matter. Then and now, in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, and, and here today, I just want to think about how we respond to racial inequity and racial injustice, inequality in our context. Now, racism is not a problem that is unique to us here in 2020 in America. There's racism uh, thousands of years ago, there's racism hundreds of years ago, there's racism today, and there will likely be racism in the future. But in our context, in our time in history, um, the, the implications of the gospel um, are played out, or played themselves out in a, I think, in a specific way, in a certain way in our context. And that's what I want to, I've been thinking about, that's what I want to talk about. You know, this past Father's Day, my grandpa told my family a story of an experience he had uh, while he was in the military. He was driving home um, from the south, he's driving up 71, when he happened upon three white guys in their military outfits uh, thumbing a ride up north. And seeing that they were military, he pulled over and let them in. It was around dinner time in Kentucky when they all decided to stop for dinner at uh, some unnamed restaurant. They walk in, sit down, and one by one the, wait the waitress takes everyone's order. Now after my grandpa ordered, uh, the waitress looks at him and says, uh, you'll have to take yours to go. Not understanding what she meant, 
Uh, he handed the menu back to her. And so, no, that's okay, uh, I'll, I'll eat here. Not really understanding what's, what's going on or what she's saying. You'll have to take yours to go. We don't serve your kind here. In much more uh, offensive language. The three other servicemen immediately stood up saying, if you won't serve all of us, we're leaving. The waitress refused and they left. Now, this story is from decades past, but it underscores the importance uh, in the history of the moment that we find ourselves in today. Now, I've been learning so much about how um, you know, the ideology of, of white supremacy and how racism in general um, have existed in America long before we were even a sovereign nation. So this isn't like necessarily like uh, an American-made problem. It just so happens to be in America, like it was lots of other places. And I think about this story, and I, and I think about how the church nearby this restaurant uh, may have treated the black people in their congregation if there were any. I wonder if any of the church members cared at all about fighting for the plight of the oppressed black people around them. To think that these things were not present in the American church of the past and do not currently affect the American church today is at best terribly naive and at worst counterproductive and destructive in the kingdom of God. Over the past month, I have not been able to stop thinking about how we as believers in Jesus, as followers of Jesus, are to respond to the problem of racial injustice in our context, in this country, in this period of time, given our history. There was a time when Peter, one of our favorite disciples, was involved in a similar situation as the one in my grandpa's story. Peter's visiting a church in Antioch that has Gentile believers. They're, they're these new Christians who are not of Jewish ancestry. Now, for, to give a little context for Peter's situation, previously throughout Israel's history, this would have never happened. Gentiles were, uh, they, they were impure, unclean people. They ate impure, unclean foods and just generally um, had sinful practices. The Israelites were called to be set apart from the Gentiles. But then Jesus came and everything changed, as what happens when Jesus comes into a life, into a world, wherever he comes, he changes things. See Ephesians 2, 14. And by the way, Peter has, at this point in time, the story with Peter, he's already had a literal vision from God, wherein God explains that Gentiles are equal to Jews. They're equal to them as they are in Christ. And that they're not to call Gentiles unclean or disassociate themselves from them. So, back to the story. Peter is hanging out with these Gentile believers in Antioch. He's eating with them and enjoying the freedom from the Mosaic law that he had through faith in Jesus. Effectively, he's like the white hitchhikers in my grandpa's story, hanging out and sitting to eat with a black guy. Eventually, some other Jews came to join the party. In fact, they were close friends with James, Jesus' brother, and were very close with Peter. These guys were not so accepting of the Gentiles and the fact that they were justified by faith alone in Jesus and sought to make them like the Jews and observe the Jewish practices before becoming real believers. Rather than standing up for the Gentiles, Peter joins them because he's scared to be criticized by them. He refuses to sit with the Gentiles, and then he goes on uh, to require them, command them to behave and act like Jews and uh, do their, uh, you know, observe the Mosaic law like all good Jewish people did. He did a complete 180. And this, this is Peter. This is the leader of the early church who preached and saw 3,000 men alone saved at Pentecost. Peter, the rock upon which Jesus would build his church. And when you have a leader like this, who 
um, behaves a certain way, who takes things a certain way, naturally everyone who he has influence over is going to join him. Right? Uh, even Barnabas, like one of uh, Paul's traveling companions, was led astray by Peter's hypocrisy. And tons of other Jews that were there followed suit. This is how you get a white church and a black church. This is how you get, this is what, what makes a Jewish church and a Gentile church. And this is not the design of God's church. This is not the picture that we see in heaven that we're praying would happen here on earth. So go with me to Galatians 2.11. This is Paul writing. Paul says, But when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face. For what he did was very wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with Gentile believers. He ate with Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of the criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. These guys come in and they, they insist that all believers in Jesus need to uh, still be circumcised and still observe some of the Mosaic laws, the very law that Jesus set them free from. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray. But when I, Paul, saw their conduct, it, that would, thought it, saw that it was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? He's like, Peter, you already know this. You've been set free from the Mosaic law. You're a Jew living like a Gentile. Why are you trying to make Gentiles live like Jews now? And I'm, I'm reading this and I'm like, I'm starting to get the, the emotion that Paul is writing, writing to the Galatian church about. It's one of his most passionate epistles. Now, to be clear, the primary or immediate textual concern here for everyone who's going to check my exegesis um, is, the, is, is how the gospel frees believers from the law. That's the immediate, the primary textual concern. Yes, I understand that. Now, the secondary textual concern, the, 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 the next or kind of what, what's underneath it is this idea of, of racial inclusion, of, of equity, right? And it speaks to um, the, these, these Jewish guys, they're, they're like ethnic, ethnocentrism, like they're, they're thinking about ethnicity. And, and I'm, I'm saying this because I, I'm, I'm not separating kind of cultural practices and, and whatnot from like ethnic heritage. I'm blending those together. So the secondary concern is, is racial inclusion, racial equity. What Paul is doing in this interaction is really important for us, and I, I don't want us to miss it, right? Paul is not passive in this interaction with these other Jews, and he's actively fighting against the exclusion, the mistreatment, and the negative perception that surrounds Gentiles, in particular, these Gentile believers. He, he's, he's taking head on, he's addressing head on in front of everyone publicly, Peter, you're wrong for this. You are absolutely wrong for this. There is nothing in your ethnic heritage that makes you superior to any other person. Yeah, it's been that way for a long time because the Jews had the law and the Jews had, uh, you know, had this, uh, they were chosen by God, right? And that happened. Then Jesus came, changed everything, and that's not how it is anymore. Now, just so you um, know that I'm not just making up my own thing and that uh, I'm not kind of bending scripture to uh, kind of fit, fit what I want to say, what I want to talk about. Here's John MacArthur writing on Galatians 2.11. He says this, So what you had was the Jews holding to their own dietary laws and a kind of developing racism toward Gentiles. We saw racism even in the day of Jonah where he didn't want to see the Gentiles repent. Jews resented, even hated Gentiles, and they were kept separate. Walter G. Hansen, a scholar and a commentary writer on the book of Galatians, among others, says this about Galatians 2.11. All the Jewish believers in Antioch were subservient to Peter's authority and followed his 
example. As a result, the church was split into racial factions. Jews were divided from Gentiles. Their action was inconsistent with their own convictions about the truth of the gospel. And here you go. They were more influenced by their common racial identity as Jews than by their new experience of unity in Christ with all believers of every race. I'm trying to point out here that um, the, the, the issue of race and racial equity and equality is absolutely in Scripture. Like, it's a very important theme in Scripture. It, it's, it's one of the, the, big, the, the big things, like the, the curtain between God and man is torn, and uh, the walls that were put up, the walls of hostility, Ephesians 2.14, um, that were put up to keep everyone separate had been torn down by Jesus. Here as it is in heaven. That's what we're praying for. And this is how we can address this in our context. In the same way that Paul opposed, uh, uh, that, that Paul apostle, uh, the apostle worked tirelessly for the expansion of the kingdom of God and the inclusion of all people groups, we too must actively work to that end in our day-to-day -day lives, in our cultural context. It's a, a, the real-life application in our context of bringing the, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. On earth as it is in heaven. Taking up the issue of, of racial equality or, or racial uh, justice is not a, just a cool social thing. It is absolutely on the heart of God. I love Paul, right? Because Paul would have absolutely been invited to the Gentile cookout, right? Um, he's the, in my grandpa's story, right? He's the white military guy who stands up in the restaurant and, and says, we're not going to be served unless you serve him too. And he corrects the waitress right then and there. Paul is, is the example for us, right? Imitate me as I imitate Christ, he says. He's not afraid of the backlash he's going to get from the face of uh, in the face of, of other Christian leaders. He's not afraid of the apostles who literally walked with Jesus. There was no fear of man in his eyes. There was no clinging to his Jewishness, right? Paul gives us the example of how we're to, to take this issue head on, to never be afraid of, of what anyone might think or, or whatever if you know that what you're saying is right. Paul is concerned that Peter would know and that we would know that racial justice, properly understood, is an entailment of the gospel. It's a deduction of the gospel. It's an implication of the gospel. Now, Jesus is the best exemplar of racial reconciliation and, and breaking norms, right? And, and if you want to know more, do an in-depth study of uh, John chapter 4 and his interaction with the Samaritan woman. Don't have time for that today. But what about us living here in the United States in the middle of a pandemic um, and a lot of social unrest? Mike Todd uh, is a pastor of a church in Oklahoma City. He's a, the Transformation Church is what it's called. And, and, and speaking about that picture in Revelation um, that we read earlier, he says, I can't wait, so I won't wait. I can't wait for, for all justice to be, to be served, right? I, I can't wait to be gathered around the throne of God, worshiping people um, from all different tribes, all different languages, all different types of people. I can't wait. So I won't wait. It was an issue for Paul, right? The inclusion and equality of Gentiles in the early church, and it should be an issue for us today. Now, I will encourage us all, and this is just kind of just goes with, with preaching the gospel and kind of bringing the kingdom of God wherever we are in our day-to-day -day lives, on our streets, in our jobs, in our families, right? I would encourage us all not only to speak about the freedom found spiritually in Jesus, but to talk about and fight for the literal physical freedom and equality for people around us that are hurting. For people around us that are oppressed, that have been uh, historically oppressed, right? And, and elsewhere in scripture where it talks about this type of thing, right? Isaiah 1, 17, God says, learn to do good, 
Seek justice, help the oppressed, defend the cause of orphan, orphans, and fight for the rights of widows. Amos 2, 6 and 7, this is what the Lord says, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not turn back my wrath. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. I don't even know what that means. They trample on the heads of the poor as upon dust of the ground and deny justice to oppressed. I understand that. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7. Is not the kind of fasting I have chosen is this not the kind of fasting I have chosen to loosen the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Amos 5, 23 and 24. Away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want to see a mighty flood of justice and an endless river of righteous living. Jesus says in Luke 4, 18, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoner and recovery of sight for the blind and to release the oppressed. On earth as it is in heaven. I love that picture. And I, like so many others, cannot wait. And so I won't wait. And so I have just four practical things for you. Four things that, that you can do today, that you can do this week, that you can do this month, wherever you're on the journey. Four things. Number one, David talked about this a couple weeks ago. Empathize. Do less talking about race and more listening to people that are different, to, to people that are suffering, to people that know about this and have experience. Listen to um, other friends' stories or uh, just other people's stories. Listen to audiobooks or read books of, of different authors who know about this, right? And that goes along with the next one. Educate yourself about racial issues in our specific American context. Right, like, like I said at, at the beginning, racism um, it, right, it is not a, uh, a problem that is unique to us, but how it's been manifested, how it's played out in our context is different than it is in other places. Understanding the nuance of this issue is very, very important. I'll put, yeah, I'll, I'll give uh, Ezra a link to put in the, the notes uh, of the video or what have you, or, or if you have any, um, you know, want any suggestions, just send me an email. Empathize, educate, engage with others who are different and ask them to share their perspectives in humility. Not with like, I already have these preconceived notions and I kind of know what I think. Like, come open and willing to listen. By the way, after you've already done some educating yourself. Finally, eliminate. Eliminate your preferences about how to address these types of issues and truly seek ways to find equity in our society. Empathize, educate, engage, and eliminate. You guys know me, right? And I, I, I'm, I'm trying to say this uh, out of love. It, it's been quite the last, you know, four to six weeks for me in our house. There's been, um, even just with my family, there's just been a lot of grieving, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of anger and rage um, uh, about I mean, not just the, the fact that you see people get killed uh, you know, on all of our screens, but just how lots of people respond to it, right? And so um, it's been hard to process a lot of this and um, I could not have preached this two weeks ago. Uh, I, I don't think I could have preached it last week because uh, there's just been so much processing, but I'm trying to say this in love. I want to say this in love. I'm trying to tell the truth in love. And I pray that if, if I'm off in interpreting this text this way, uh, if, if I'm totally off on something, that, that God would correct me, that one of you would correct me. Um, if you have any questions, um, if I said something that you don't understand, uh, if, if there's something you want to know more about, um, please send me an email. Stacy at 614church.org. Um, I never really got too many emails after times I've preached, but I suspect that I could probably get some this time. 
I love you all, uh, and I, I understand you all are on a journey, I'm on a journey, uh, and I'm just hoping that we can walk it together. Thanks. Wow, what a powerful word from Stacy this morning. I pray that we all lean in to what God might be saying to us this week after listening to that. If you have a testimony about how God has been working in your life, or you need prayer for something specific, please reach out to one of the leaders here so that we can stand with you. Feel free to email 614church.org to get in touch with us. Remember to follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay connected with what's going on throughout the week. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you have an awesome week, and we'll see you next week right back here. <laughs>